Who is the most underrated actor of all time? It's Dolph Lundgren. Correct. Why? Well, because of his uh, spiky hair and yep. his ice cold demeanor and his big muscles. Absolutely. I must break you. My name is Sergeant Andrew Scott. Come on, guys, don't do this. If I don't get breakfast, I get real grumpy. I don't think you like me grumpy. And you go in pieces, asshole. Let's kick some ass. Hello and welcome back to I must break this podcast, the fan podcast celebrating the cinematic career of action icon Dolph Lundgren. Today, we're going back to 2017 and discussing the action horror comedy, Don't Kill It. In this fun take on the demon possession subgenre, Lundgren plays Jebediah Woodley, a self-proclaimed demon hunter who travels to a small Mississippi town to stop the murderous rampage of an ancient demon that's inhabiting the bodies of the town locals. Yet catching this demon won't be easy, as there's one small problem. The demon will possess the body of whoever kills it. Your father's home early. Hey there, how'd it go? This is the latest killing in a town that has had three triple homicides in the last week alone. Ugh, I'll be damned. I'm looking for Chief Dunham. It's Agent Pierce. Tell me, Agent Pierce, is it really necessary bringing in the bureau? You have had three triple homicides in the past week, is that correct? It doesn't make any sense. They are unrelated, right? Well, they might be the tiniest bit related. In what way would that be, Chief? Each one killed the last. Your town is in real danger. If you want these murders to stop, you best listen. I'm a hunter. Demon hunter. You said this one is unique. How? So the way you transfigured was by being killed. The moment you killed the thing, it became you. And what are you going to do when you find him? Oh, I'll sit him down for a quiet little chat. Why did you bring this evil to this town? They shoot us in the exorcist. Oh, no, you all. Rubber bullets. It likes you. It wants me to kill it. The stakes just got a whole lot higher. If the fan consumes your soul, and then Chickory Creek will literally be held with us. Emily, don't do it! Don't do it! I'm your host, Sean, and joining me today uh, to chat this one is Katrina Hill from the website Action Flick Chick and the author of Action Movie Freak. Kate, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is, I mean, before we get to this film, I have to, I have to ask you, I, um, I picked up your book, Action Movie Freak, um, quite a while ago, actually. Um, I loved, I love reading this book. And then I um, started perusing your website, which is also equally uh, fun to take a look at as well. Tell me a little bit about all of these things and, and how you fell in love with this particular genre of film. You know, I think it, um, it even goes back to probably my childhood. You know, I have two older brothers and I feel like like there was always action movies on, even when I was too young to probably be watching it, but I would just be there anyway. So I think my love for action movies kind of started then. And then how I got into writing about it is, honestly, it came from Rambo, the fourth one. And I saw it, and it was just so amazing. And I just out there with the action. And I was like, I have to write about this. It's like, does anyone else love this movie as much as I do? So I just kind of wrote about it and put it out there. And then I just have kept going since then. Yeah. Rambo. I remember when that came out, I remember seeing it in the theaters, uh, 2007. And it was, it was surreal because at the time, I mean, you know, um, Stallone had his comeback with Rocky. He brought back Rocky Balboa. 
but there was a lot of hesitation, I remember, from, um, well, not, not so much critics, but also from fans. It was like, man, is he really going to be able to resurrect this character 20 years later? And what, uh, what Sly did, which was just amazing, is he went back to basics. I mean, he went back to basics with the character. He told a very simple meat and potatoes story, and he amped up the carnage to a whole other level, which was awesome to see. So, Yes. Yeah. And, you know, part of a good action movie is having, you know, the bad guy or villains that you really hate. And, boy, do you really want to see those bad guys get their comeuppance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, in your book, Action Movie Freak, um, which is available to anyone listening uh, on Amazon, um, this, I mean, you can tell that, yeah, this, I mean, first of all, it's beautifully published. I mean, the pictures and the the, the um, various write-ups that you have of all these films, I'm actually looking at it right now, um, is, is amazing. I have to ask, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, but <laughs> um, included with the book is a DVD movie, uh, The Impossible Kid. I, I have to ask how that came about. Um, uh, for anyone listening to The Impossible Kid, I didn't even know that this movie existed, but it's a uh, uh, a little parody um, from the early 70s um, that is included in the book. I, I believe it's, uh, it's a film that's been in the public domain for quite some time. Uh, is, is this a favorite of yours that you said, I have to have this film included with the purchase of this book? <laughs> so, no. So, yeah, this it came about mostly from the publisher, because I had not actually heard of that movie either, but it was public domain. And, um, you know, there, there are other uh, movie freak books, like horror movie freak and stuff. So this is one in a series. Um, and they always include a DVD of, of some movie. So that just came about, I think, a lot because it was public domain and they could do it. Um, but also that it fell into the right, you know, action category. Very nice. Very nice. Well, yeah, it is, it is a, uh, it is a trip of a film to, uh, to, yeah. to, to watch. Yeah. Now I have to ask, what about, before we get to Don't Kill It, um, what about Dolph Lundgren? Where has he, you mentioned Rambo. I know that you're obviously a huge uh, Rambo fan. I'm assuming Sylvester Stallone as well, but what about Dolph Lundgren? Where has he always stood for you in the, uh, in the pantheon of action stars? You know, I um, hate to say it, but he's kind of fallen onto the back burner because my main loves are Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course. Um, so this doing this podcast has really opened Dolph Lundgren to me. So I think I'm going to go exploring more of his movies after this. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, and I'm, I'm glad. I mean, that's the that's the great thing about the show is obviously getting to meet new people such as yourself, but kind of getting to expose them to the um, quite extensive and I think uh, for many largely unseen filmography of Mr. Lundgren. And so, yeah, when you and I first got in contact with one another, I I asked you, okay, well, here's where we're here's where we're at in in terms of uh, Lundgren's filmography. What um, what film would you like to discuss? And you pretty much singled out this one. You handpicked this one and you said, is don't kill it available? Cause I'd really like to chat this one. So I guess out of all of, uh, out of all of uh, Lundgren's films, the ones that were available, of course, why this one, why'd you select don't kill it? Yeah. So I went through and I was watching some trailers for, I wanted a movie that looked fun and that had him more as a star instead of because, you know, he does a lot of movies also where he's not the star. He just has a cameo or a really small part. Um, so that's pretty much why I chose this one. Well, and this is this is a wild one um, to look at. I mean, I'll just say it right now. I mean, like I said earlier, it is a uh, it's a little bit of action, a little bit of horror, a lot of comedy. I think we can agree. I mean, there's there, there's a lot to say about this one. Well, before we you know dive into the uh, into the plot of the film and everything that's going on, um, I wanted to discuss uh, briefly the. Um, the director of the film, as well as the uh, the production of the film. Now, I don't know how much you looked into this or how much research you did. I'm I'm not obviously expecting you to do <laughs> to do any, but um, the director of this film is a gentleman by the name of Mike Mendez. Now, I don't know if you follow him at all on social media or not, but this guy, I mean, <clears throat> it's really interesting. He is a huge 
fan of the horror genre. I mean, it's very clear that he is a fanboy at heart. I mean, if you just follow him on social media and you see his various posts, I mean, he has a huge collection of horror artifacts from movies and, 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 and whatnot. I mean, he's also oh, wow. his, yeah, his, his filmography is, is pretty interesting. In addition to uh, uh, directing this particular film, he's also directed a film by the, uh, by the name of The Grave Dancers, another one called Big Ass Spider, and his most recent effort is uh, called Satanic Hispanics. So clearly, oh. this is a guy who uh, who respects, appreciates, and really, really loves the uh, the low budget horror genre. And judging by the press junket interviews, I was actually going to play some of the uh, some clips from um, some of the press junkets that uh, that the both uh, Mike Mendez and Dolph Lundgren participated in. But they really seem to get along quite well. They have a great chemistry. But I mean, for all the directors who they could have hired for this one, I mean, Mike Mendez, he, I mean, you can tell. He has a path. Yeah, you know, I did see probably one of those interviews you're talking about. And yes, he does. I remember him saying something like uh, he was not interested if it doesn't come with like blood and horror or something like that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and I guess he was uh, he was attached to direct this film for over four years. So if you looked at the original script, I'd love to get my hands on the original script, okay? Because I guess the the an initial um, conceit and premise it was written um, as kind of like a uh, Fargo mixed with Thirty Days of Night, kind of is what I read. Mm-hmm. It was supposed to be set in Alaska. However, once it was greenlit and the, uh, um, you know, the, the project was a go picture, suddenly they said, okay, we got to move to Mississippi and shoot this in Mississippi. Okay. Um, the budget was less than a, than a million. And I guess 15,000 of that was raised via um, Indiegogo. So here they are. They're jetting off to uh, Mississippi, changing Alaska to Mississippi, because I guess Mendez was of the mentality. He was like, look, we're not going to cover the ground in uh, fake snow and pretend it's Alaska. Not only is that costly, but that's going to look cheap. So everybody had to adapt extremely quickly to what they had. And this film was shot in just 17 days. I mean, and and that right there is amazing. I mean, mean, and just imagine you're told, oh, hey, you're going to be shooting a movie next month. You got to change the location from Alaska to Mississippi and you have to have it done by the end of next month. I mean, those kind of constraints are crazy. Yeah, yeah. And I think he it even said he had like, what, 12 days to prepare before they started shooting. So that is really impressive. Right. Well, we basically made the entire movie, and I mean the entire movie in a month, <laughs> which is uh, incredible to me. Uh, you know, we had been attached, you know, Dolph had read it like a, like a year before, and I'd been attached for about three years but when we finally got the green light it was a week before thanksgiving and and i was like great when are we making it january february like oh no we got to shoot it before christmas uh and i'm like that, that's in like six weeks uh and they're like yeah can you get on a plane tomorrow <laughs> and uh and yeah we did you know i i know it's all a blur i don't know how we did it but we had 12 days to to prep everything all the locations hire all the actors Hire the crew, uh, you know, uh, get the costumes, get the, you know, I mean, everything from top to bottom, uh, 12 days and then 17 days to shoot it. Uh, so it was a whirlwind, but, but, uh, somehow we pulled it off. So. Wow. And sadly, I mean, that, that's kind of the norm, I think, these days for a lot of these independent, uh, uh, low budget productions. But, um, especially, I mean, if you look at a lot of, uh, a lot of the films that Dolph has, uh, been doing of the past 10 years, I think he's, uh, he's pretty familiar with, uh, this, this MO, I, I think we can say, but I mean, man, I think every, that, that's the thing I think I'm going to come back to with this film is yes, it is pretty cheesy. And yes, there's some parts where you're kind of like, okay, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a reason this didn't go theatrical, but at the end, I mean, you can tell that everybody who was on screen is really, really trying and is extremely invested in making a, uh, making a product that they can be proud of. Yeah, and that matters. Yeah, because you can tell when people are bored or they don't want to be there and it just brings down the whole film. So. Yeah, so um, principal pho- photography for this one commenced over uh, 
uh, Christmas in 2015. Uh, it was down in Lexington, Mississippi. Okay. Um, you already said it, but Mendez had barely 12 days to prep beforehand. And so, um, that's, that's pretty much what they did. It was pretty much let's go. Um, I guess the, uh, he claims, I read this online, but, uh, Mendez claims that, uh, the town that was used for filming had never shot a movie there before. Okay. And it was, uh, actually one of the poorest suburbs in America. However, once this little production came rolling into town, especially with Dolph Lundgren on board, it sounds like all of the locals were just super ecstatic. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. I, I would be excited if he came to Dallas. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I guess if we, let, let's talk about the character that Dolph plays. Um, Dolph plays Jebediah Woodley. I mean, Gosh, we can, we can, I mean, make the entire podcast, I think, about this character. This is probably one of the wildest, most interesting characters that Dolph has ever played. And I think, in my opinion, I think it's clear that this is one of the aspects, if not the aspect that attracted Dolph to this film. Okay. So if we just break down the character, you know, you know what? Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to put it on to you. How would you, how would you describe the character of Jebediah Woodley? Oh, let's see. He's definitely sarcastic. I do I love his sarcasm and his humor through being sarcastic. Um, he's pretty bold and confident, and he's right to the point as well. He doesn't beat around the bush. He's just like, okay, we can, you know, you can believe me about this being a demon, or you can all die, and I'll still be doing what I'm doing. <laughs> So what did you like about the script when you saw it? Because I love if horror. It's a, it's a delightful bit of schlock. It's, it's great, actually. I love that type of film. So what did you do? Uh, well, the script was just a great script. It was just a, a page turner, you know. And the main character, Jebediah Woodley, is this crazy guy. He was kind of an action guy with a sense of humor and some slight bad manners sometimes. And mm-hmm. he's got a lot of flaws, you know, and it's, it was an easy character to play. A fun character to play. I wanted to play him. And then I, I met Mike, and Mike had some great ideas, and I saw his movies, and yeah, I felt like a, like a different project than I'm used to, you know. Well, you know, this, these writers, they, they just, uh, they just had original ideas, you know. This mm-hmm. character just keeps talking, and he just won't shut up, you know. Just, you know, and that's just funny, I mean, because action guys usually don't get to say that much. And I think actually it was kind of a breakthrough for me in one way, because Doing the picture and getting a little more confidence in that. You know, I've done many movies in, as an action guy. I mean, I can do a fight scene or, you know, play the ba- you know tough guy or bad guy, you know, in my sleep, you know. But this stuff takes a little more effort. So, in other things I've done since then, I've I've tried to take out the turns a little more as an actor and have a little more fun and try to embellish more and, and pick roles that are more unusual. So I think it's it was a natural progression, really. Well, yeah, he's a he's a self-professed demon hunter. Okay, I mean, and if you look at his attire, okay, I mean that that's the thing that's that's so great about this character. He's this demon hunter. He wears this long leather duster. He has kind of the this you know kind of cowboy hat that he wears. He uh, sports a southern accent. He's always wearing all sorts of uh, jewelry and necklaces. And I think one of the funniest characteristics about him is he's vaping in just about every scene. Yeah. Yeah, does he kind of remind you of Indiana Jones, except for the vaping, but his attire? Yeah, I think that's what he's, I think that, that's what he's channeling, is that he's, uh, yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's kind of going for like an Indiana Jones. And I think, I mean, that, that's what's also interesting about this film, is, I mean, if, if they wanted to, this character could be a franchise. You know what I mean? I, and I kind of wonder if that was kind of the idea that uh, Mike Mendez and, and Dolph were going into with this was, okay, if it did really, really well, then Jebediah Woodley could return in other sequels where maybe he's not battling demons, but he's battling other kind of mystical monsters and whatnot. Yeah. And I think what's also what's also kind of refreshing about this one, I mean, you said it earlier regarding um, – regarding Dolph's prolific output of the past 10 years. But yeah, he's always, for the most part, it seems like he's taken on like a lot of supporting roles and, and that's fine. But in this film, I mean, one of the ways that that was kind of um, refreshing for me is you can tell how heavily invested Dolph is in this project because he's in just about every scene. I don't know if you picked up on that or not. I mean, but this is about an 85 minute movie, maybe 
but he's in just about every scene, which compared to many of the other efforts of the last few years where he shows up in maybe a supporting role here or there, you almost kind of forget that he's even in those movies. But in this one, I mean, he dominates. This is his movie. Yes, he gets a ton of dialogue, too. Um, I think in one of the interviews I saw with him, he commented on that. He, he That's one of the parts that it attracted him to this movie was just how much he actually got to act and have dialogue instead of just, you know, having a, a scene here and there of action and a few lines. Um, but he really gets, he has a lot of dialogue in this movie. And it's funny. I mean, I, I, I was going to be bringing up one of the one of the uh, moments in the film where I busted up laughing, but a lot of his lines and the way in which he's delivering them is quite comical. I mean, I think that's pretty uh, <laughs> pretty fun to see as well. Yeah, he's surprisingly good at the comedy. Well, I mean, and I, I kind of directed you to this before before our discussion. I don't know if you've seen it or if you're familiar with it or not. But what's interesting is this is not the first film that Dolph has done where he has um, battled a, uh, a body-jumping demon. Okay, back in the late 90s, he did a film called The Minion. Are you familiar with The Minion? No. Okay, okay. Well, boy, okay, you got to check that one out. That was pretty <laughs> Um, in, in the minion, uh, Dolph plays a uh, priest who travels to New York to, uh, to stop a demon that is doing the same thing. It's traveling from, uh, from body to body in hopes of, uh, uh, releasing the antichrist, I guess. So it's just really kind of interesting that Dolph can say at the end of the day, okay, when he hangs it up in his career, that he starred in two movies that involve a, a demon that is, possessing bodies. I, I guess that's where the similarities end because Jebediah Woodley is completely different than a, and than a priest, but it's just, it's just kind of wild that um, he uh, has had the, uh, the fortune of signing on to uh, uh, <laughs> scripts that kind of have uh, a similar villain. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to get your take real quick on um, the, um, I guess we can say she's the second lead in the film. Uh, Christina Klebe plays uh, the character agent Evelyn Pierce. I don't know about you, but I, I think uh, I, I haven't seen Christina Cleave in a heck of a lot. I guess she was in, I guess she was in Hellboy, the one that came out um, with David Harbour. Um, I know she was also in the Rob Zombie Halloween remake. To be honest, I really don't remember her in either of those films. But I think she's doing a a, a pretty. You know what's interesting about it is she's playing the role so serious against everybody else who's kind of um, going for broke and being silly that. I think it's a uh, it's they they kind of uh, play off each other quite well. Yes, yeah, no, she is. Um, well, I don't remember her in any of those other movies either. So <laughs> I was like, oh, um, but yeah, she's very you know straight laced, kind of a stick in the mud. But it does also kind of work because everyone else is so funny or you know wacky or incompetent that. I guess you need one person to kind of anchor it down. For yeah, person. yeah, yeah, yeah. And she she does a great job anchoring it down. I mean, you know, she's tough, she's confident. Um, so yeah, she does a wonderful job. Um, and so if we just dive right into the film, I mean, I I don't know about you, but I I, I kind of dug the opening scenes of this film. You know, I mean, it, it like we keep saying, it is silly and it is tongue in cheek and pretty comical. But I like how it opens pretty dark and scary where um, this hunter, uh, his name is uh, Gabriel, I guess he's um, out hunting deer in in Mississippi. Um, His dog comes upon this um, small little golden container, which releases the demon. This of course possesses the dog. And so the dog then uh, attacks Gabriel, Gabriel shoots the dog. So then Gabriel is possessed with the demon and pretty much this is how the demon continually gets from body to body as whoever kills it, the demon jumps into that body. Yes. You know, I did not particularly enjoy the opening sequence. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I think cause you know, I know it's like it's action. It's, it's gory, but I think with it involving children, it really was like a no for me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, you know, now that you bring that up, yeah, they, I guess if we go near the end of the film, the demon also inhabits a child once again, and 
that scene near the end, they're using a lot of wire work and whatnot with that little girl yeah. and everything. Um, yeah, it is pretty dark. I guess, I don't know, the, the, the tones do kind of take a bit of a jarring shift, I guess, now that you mention it. Um, yeah, yeah, it yeah, just seems, uh, the, yeah, the, you know, the opening sequences are pretty serious and they're intense. Yeah. And they're, yeah, they're really intense. And um, I mean, it gets to the action quickly, which is always what I like to see, but, but it just didn't work for me. And I think if I, I was really trying to think about why. Um, and I think it's because, well, it's, you know, these demon possessed people are breaking into homes and just brutally murdering kids and families until you know someone shoots that person and then it body hops and it goes on and it um takes out i don't know what four or five kids and i think that's what really bugs me i'm like oh, i don't know violence against kids Ugh. <laughs> yeah yeah well and i guess now that we're talking about it i guess one thing that's um kind of uh slightly problematic is I mean, did I miss something or are we, we're never really given a reason why this demon is doing this or, or what he is in search of. I mean, if we go back to the, um, the previous Dolph Lundgren uh, demon jumping movie, the minion, okay. The demon is there and he's jumping bodies. So again, so that he can uh, release his master who happens to be the antichrist. But here is this, is that the demons thing? He just likes to go out and, slaughter families like what is it that the demon is in search of I, they, they never really care to say do they no i don't think we missed anything i just don't think it was explained it was just kind of a yeah, it's a demon this is what it does move on it's let's bad. go don't don't think it's about it too hard yeah <laughs> well and you know i mean that's the thing that's interesting about the film you know that someone is inhabited by the demon because of two traits Okay, there are two things that this film does. Number one, they have dark black eyes. And number two, they make this crazy shrieking noise that is just like nails on a chalkboard here. Um, yes. I'll go, to, I'll go to you real quick. I mean, it, it, it was cool in the first, I, I guess in the first scene, it's kind of like, okay. But man, they keep, I mean, that shriek persists throughout this 85-minute runtime of the movie constantly i mean i i guess yeah. i guess we, we shouldn't expect the demon to have profound conversations with the characters but man it it um it, it tests your patience i guess yes yeah as it as it goes on you're like okay can can you shut up now because <laughs> ooh, yeah that is a horrible screech well okay so the the fact that Multiple families have been uh, have been slaughtered due to the due to the demon. This alerts um, multiple people. Um, before it alerts the FBI and uh, Agent Pierce comes in, um, we find out that uh, this is where Dolph Lundgren's character Jebediah Woodley um, he comes in. Okay, he hears about these murders on the radio, and so he travels to the uh, the small town to investigate. Um, I, I will say, you know, I, I like I like Dolph's introduction in the film i like his inclusion in the film and again we're talking about the comedy here okay and the, i mentioned earlier the scene that really made me crack up but it's where they're at a diner okay so agent pierce christina Cleve's character she shows up and she's also there with the sheriff of uh, chicory creek that's where this film takes place is uh, chicory creek mississippi so they're at this diner and uh dolph is uh, i love this scene because dolph is just chowing down on a plate of ribs and he's letting yes. them know, okay, here's what's going on. Okay, you have this demon here. Okay, I know about this. You need to trust me. And then when the check comes, okay, this was so I thought was funny. When the check comes, okay, Dolph's not going to pay for it. And so he just casually turns around and starts marveling at a tree that's in the restaurant. Did you notice that? Yes, I did. Yeah, I did really like that scene. <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, look at this Christmas tree. And even the other chief is like, oh, I can't seem to find my wallet. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and so we find out, okay, and, and that's what's also interesting about the film, is Dolph knows immediately how to stop the demon. Okay, he has a foolproof plan. Well, what you do is you, you cook up a poison, OK, and so the person is going to drink the poison and then kill the demon. So in that way, when it comes into the body of the person who drank the poison, that person is dead. So that will theoretically stop the demon. Um, 
it's a pretty uh, uh, it's a pretty foolproof plan, right? There you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it just still seems like, you know, you could probably find another way. I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but he, he does seem set on, like, this is how we did it once, so this is how we're going to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we've done it once. Um, flashback sequence where he's talking about how his dad um, did it. I don't know if you picked up on that or not, but his dad is played by um, Tony Messenger, who is um, Lundgren's uh, go-to stunt double, who has stunt doubled for him in quite a few films, who was actually a friend of the show, got to chat with him on a previous episode. So um, it's always cool when they give him, uh, when they give Tony a uh, a role where he's purely not just a stunt double, where he actually, you actually get to focus on his face. So. <laughs> yeah, I did not know that. Well, that's, that's good for him. <laughs> and so I, I want to get your take real quick on the, on the weapon. Okay, that uh, the Jebediah Woodley has. Okay, so this this weapon that he uses is featured prominently on the film's artwork. It's a giant gun that shoots out a net. So I guess he's planning on using this to capture the demon. Um, you know, I mean, for, for a film that is as uh, uh, violent as as this particular film is, it it is kind of an interesting uh, um, weapon choice. I think for our lead to have a giant net gun rather than um, Anything else that we've seen Dolph use throughout his career? You know what I mean? He's just—he's not using. I don't even think. Well, Dolph, he does use a gun, but it's rubber bullets, right? So yeah, it's rubber bullets. So yeah, I you know I did like the look of the net gun because I mean it is big and imposing. It looks heavy. It looks solid. Um, looks like it could take down a person. Um, and it fits like you know you don't want to kill it, so that fits. <laughs> Um, well, one thing, you know, when he's getting out of jail or whatever, and they're handing him a whole bunch of stuff, so they hand him a whip, but then we never yeah. see yeah. that again. So I was like, well, that, that could have also been useful. They could have well, used that. But there's the it sequel. Goes off there's, into the wind. <laughs> yeah, no, there's the Jebediah Woodley sequel. Well, maybe we would get to see him use the whip. Yeah, that is a funny scene where he's being uh, released from prison. They have all these various. I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot about that. Yeah, but the sheriff, um, his delivery is great there. But yeah, um, he's pulling out what is it like a shrunken head? Yeah, and, <laughs> like, like a bear trap and all these yeah. like crazy things. That sadly, I mean, do you think for such a colorful character? That that uh, that Jebediah Woodley is that we would um, get to see him utilize some of that, but yeah, no, we don't, do we? No, no, and actually, that's kind of one of my, I guess, criticisms or or one thing I'm sad about is that, yeah, Dolph he or Jebediah pretty much sticks to the nut gun and yeah. nothing else, I guess, nothing else when. I don't know. We don't really get to see him do a lot of actiony things for as much as he's the supposed hero, I guess, or the demon hunter. I don't feel like he actually got to do much action. Well, that's, that's an inter- that's an excellent segue actually, because yeah, I mean, if we go to, in my opinion, what is the real money shot moment of the film, the, um, the town hall meeting scene. Okay. Oh. I mean, the, the town hall meeting scene is wild, but yeah, no, you bring up an interesting point um, for as wild as this scene is. And there's plenty of blood and shooting and whatnot. Dolph is pretty much just standing around uh, with his net gun. Yeah. <laughs> just saying, don't kill it. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just agree. Yeah. Like that is probably my favorite scene of the whole movie. It, you know, that is, the wildest, craziest scene. There's a lot in there to talk about and decompress. <laughs> and we're like, okay, was that an intentional choice or was that just a oversight and they weren't paying much to like when they were like locking the doors and stuff. But anyway, but Dolph just stands there. He like, you know, the demons jumping from body to body because, you know, people are being slaughtered and he's just like, Hey, hold still. <laughs> and he's he's standing there holding still, but and it's like, okay, you're not gonna I don't know, tackle him or do something. 
Well, I mean, yeah. So let's let's give a little bit of context. But um, so yeah, Sheriff Dunham. Okay, he organizes this town hall meeting late at night to kind of um, to warn the town about what's going on. And during his speech, okay, the demon just comes walking in. Again, I guess the demon's purpose is purely just to kill. Maybe I guess That's just it. to kill and cause chaos. Th- there is it. Yeah, it's just chaos. So the demon comes walking in and just starts slaughtering everyone. And so <laughs> I, I guess... <laughs> what, okay, the, the- so yeah, so I have to just real quick. Uh, yeah, so the demon... <laughs> Closes the doors from the inside and puts an axe through the handles from the inside of the town hall meeting. And then when the chaos starts and people are dying, there's like 25 people at the door and they can't open the door. Even though I'm like, (laughs) just the axe is on the inside. Just remove the axe. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I, mean, I think it's at this point in the film. I mean, if, in case anybody who's coming in did not know that this is a, um, I don't want to say it's at the level of a parody, but that it's, it's extremely silly and not meant to be taken serious. I mean, yeah, it's here. So yeah, the demon comes in and immediately starts a killing rampage to which, um, the sheriff's police force they start uh, shooting at it, and so one cop will kill it, and then he gets possessed with the demon, so then the other cop kills him, then he gets possessed. And so it's just the cycle. I think even an old lady gets yes. gets possessed at one point. And so, I mean, man, this you get some gnarly stuff here. I think even a chainsaw is yeah. is used. And, I mean, it's just – and like you said, you have poor Jebediah who's just standing there in the middle. And, and what's interesting is – He's just a visitor to this town. So you get the sense very clearly that I don't think he cares. There's really no stakes in it for him at all. Okay. He's just traveled to this town. So he really doesn't give a crap about anybody. And he's just standing around just, ah, oh, shit. Like, come on, another one. Quit killing it, guys. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But yes. But I'm also like, well, no, he doesn't care about anybody in the town because, yeah, he's just passing through trying to catch the demon, and that's kind of who he is. He's, well, I'm a demon hunter, but uh, I like you should be trying to stop just for hum- humanity. Like, <laughs> I don't know, but like, you should be trying to stop this demon before they kill everyone in the town. <laughs> well, and so um, I'm, I'm trying to remember how. Um, so the, the demon does escape the, the town hall. They're not able to, uh, to, to catch it, obviously. Um, and it, uh, it goes off into the woods, into a neighborhood, and it now possesses this, uh, this little girl. And they, the dad has locked the little girl in, uh, in his basement, and he is understandably distraught. Um, I'll, I'll go to you real quick. I know we talked about your, your feelings about the, uh, about the opening scene. What's really interesting about this moment here, and I don't know how you, how you took it, but so we have this little girl. She's, um, she's now possessed. She's trapped in her basement. Um, the dad is extremely distraught. And so Dolph pretty much tells him his plan. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to drink this poison. So Dolph is mixing this poison on his, <laughs> just think this yeah. is just such a wild scene. Dolph mixing, po- he's wearing this leather duster and he's, cooking it on this get poor guy's yeah. <laughs> kitchen stove. Um, so he's mixing this poison and the dad is just crying. He's probably overacting a little bit. And uh, uh, Dolph is just like, yeah, you know, you got to do what you got to do. You got to shoot your daughter here. Um, I, I, I'll go to you. What, what did you think of, uh, of these moments here? So again, I was like, what is with the, the, these acts against children? <laughs> but, <laughs> This one, I guess, it didn't bother me as much because you don't see the violence played out towards... Because this, this, the little girl who is possessed, I guess, supposedly, I'm assuming, kills her sister right before she gets locked in the basement. Um, and so at first, when you know, you're, you're watching the scene where the little girl has to kill the demon to in order to become possessed and i'm like i don't want to see these kids like kill each other and but it doesn't show that so it's like okay i'm not as bothered by that it's kind of just off screen understood but i don't know what it's like why children yeah hits harder (laughs) i don't know 
Well, there is some, I mean, I will say, I mean, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but I will say that there is some extremely impressive wire work here. I mean, and, and you look yeah. at it again for this film, only, only having 17 days to shoot for them being able to prep the scene and film this scene as efficiently as they did and make it look as, as polished as, as I think it turns out is, is quite the accomplishment because yeah, this little girl, the way she is flying around the room, jumping on the backs of all these FBI agents. I mean, I will say it, it's, it's quite impressive. I mean, it's, it's a very, um, yes. it, it's, it's a really cool choreographed uh, scene here. Yes. Yeah. That was one of the um, best. Cause like you said, they use the wire work and everything. So, and you can tell it's a stunt double. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't hoist this poor little girl um, up. Yeah, to... <laughs> and, and she's you know she's dealing out the violence, you know, because that's I guess that's also one of the things is from the opening scene is that you know they're they're just children watching TV, and you're like, okay, well that's terrible, but now she's like possessed and she's attacking them, so you know they obviously they have to defend themselves. And so if we go into the uh, into the final real sequence of the film, um, the, uh, the, the demon flees, okay, into the woods, okay, and um, possesses a couple more people. One of the, uh, one of the individuals it possesses is, um, is the priest of the town. Now, I directed you to this, uh, to this earlier, um, but the priest is played by uh, James Chalk, who happens to be a, uh, a close personal friend of Lundgren. So... Um, Dolph always tries to hook his buddy up with uh, with various roles. When I spoke with James Chalk um, a few years ago on the show, he had actually singled out this film as being his his favorite experience um, working with Dolph. He actually really enjoyed um, this particular film, and he does get some uh, he does get some fun scenes. Okay, before he's possessed, he's you know splashing holy water at uh, at Lundgren, you know, saying, let the power of Christ compel you to where Lundgren has to roll his eyes and say, I think that's exorcist, you know? I mean, it's yeah. it's all real silly, but um, I... I did I, enjoy I, I that scene. Yeah, yeah. That was probably, I guess, my second favorite, because it was like, yeah, that's funny. He's like, oh, that's just from The Exorcist. What are you doing? That's rude. Quit throwing water on me. And then <laughs> I, I did laugh out loud when he, Dolph takes his gun out and shoots him because in the church for a moment, in the church in the church in front of his, <laughs> in front of a crowd of people <laughs> who are in the church trying to i don't know be whatever they're doing um yeah and for a moment you forget that he has rubber bullets so you're like oh my god did he just shoot a priest <laughs> yeah so i did love that part and so the, um, I mean, we, we, we haven't really, we've kind of glossed over it, but, um, we find out that, uh, Agent Pierce, okay, this is Christina Klebe's character. She actually has a, uh, a linkage to the demon here, right? Where the demon is, is actually sparing her because of, um, she has some ancestral, uh, heritage that's linked to the demon. Is that right? Yes. Apparently she's an angel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. What a, yeah, uh, apparently, then they just kind of say that Dolph is just like, oh, yeah, I saw the marks on your back. You're an angel. And that's why he wants your body. So. It's like, and okay. so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So they just say that and they go on. She's an angel. <laughs> And so we get, I mean, I, I do kind of like how these scenes play out. So we have Dolph, he's pinned against the tree, okay, by the priest. Um, he's screaming at, uh, at Agent, Agent Pierce, you know, to not kill the demon. Um, however, she, what, what is she? She puts a, a vest of grenades on her, yes. okay? And then she shoots the, uh, she shoots the priest. This, of course, the demon then goes into her body. Um, we get the black eyes. We get the shriek as well that we've gone. And then I do kind of like this scene. I mean, it, it's, it's cheesy, sure, but it, it's really um, stylistically, it looks kind of cool because she's levitating in the air. We have some slow motion. She's shrieking the whole time, but there's these just, okay. It's combined with the slow motion, like I said, but we have these intense colors that, uh, that Mike Mendez is employing. Okay. These, these colors of purple and whatnot. It's all a very striking moment of her just in the air, shrieking slow motion and then she pulls the pin on the vest boom there you go demon is gone yes and so the explosion is 
quite something as well. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it's just explosion. You kind of see little limbs fly off screen and that's it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting because then, okay. Once, once she's, uh, when she's gone, you know, it's interesting. We haven't said it, but, um, they do. One thing that I appreciated about this film is they do kind of make her a, a, a bit of a love interest to Jebediah's character but they don't focus too much on it. I think they do. They do kiss in one scene, but that's about it. I, I almost kind of wonder if they even really needed that. But they don't linger on this blossoming relationship too much. But um, but yeah, Dolph seems to be. Uh, I don't know. He he gets kind of a, a one shot look on his face where he's a little bit disappointed, and then he just grabs a little silver canister, scoops the demon up, which apparently is a, just a little orange orb. I guess that he's yeah. able to, to scoop up into uh, into his little flask, and um, the demon is captured despite slaughtering God how, the entire town of Chicory Creek. I think, I think it got the entire t- I, you know Chief Dunham made it out because <laughs> earlier after the uh, town hall meeting, I, I do love that too. That the Chief Dunham was just like, "Fuck it, I'm out of here." And, you know, uh, Evelyn's like, are you going to run away from this? You need to stand and fight. And he's like, uh, no. And he just goes. Yeah. So I, I did be the I, only surviving person. I did. We, we didn't mention it, but I did like at the, uh, at the town hall scene when, you know, there's all this killing and mayhem and chaos, how he's just sitting back with his, uh, with his face in his hands. And he's yeah. just like, oh, what do I do? You yeah. know, like, it looks like he's trying not to throw up. Yeah. <laughs> He's just like, ooh. <laughs> yeah, and I, so, I did like him. Well, and if we look at the uh, at the final moments of the film, I mean, th- this is another, <laughs> this part here. Um, so, so Dolph has the flask, right? And yeah. there is this hilariously ridiculous moment. I mean, it just visually, I busted out laughing, okay? So it's such a wild juxtaposition of imagery here. So we have Dolph, he's on a boat. How he got a boat, how he rented a boat or anything like that, I have no idea. But it's just, it looks so ridiculous. He's on this boat, okay, out in the middle of the ocean, wearing his leather duster, okay, yeah. <laughs> out there in the middle of the ocean. He chucks the uh, the flask uh, into the water, and then we uh, we see through some, uh, um, actually some decent CGI, I will say, um, the flask is then consumed by a great white shark. I guess that the uh, the events are going to repeat in the near future. I guess probably it just maybe underwater for the time being. I have no idea, but um, yeah, that's how the film ends. I guess until the next Jebediah Woodley adventure. Yeah, you know, I I wouldn't mind. I think seeing another Jebediah Woodley film because I did like Dolphin this character. What did you What did you think of the end? I'm just curious. Um, I guess. All of those things I mentioned, the boat, the duster on the boat, the shark. um, Yeah. Yeah. He, um, again, I feel like he's kind of an idiot for throwing it into the ocean. I don't know, because he, it just seems like there could be better ways to take care of it or you know, I don't know, put it in a block of cement. So, you know, is, you know, throwing it into the ocean just feels like, yeah, something's going to release it at some point in time (laughs) or you know a shark's gonna i guess eat it and so it was a little silly and like uh okay i don't think that made the best that wasn't the best judgment but that's what happened so here we go i was kind of surprised that he didn't hold on to it i mean this is a guy who we've seen he walks around with bear traps and shrunken heads and whatnot you would think that in his uh, in his arsenal of uh, of apothecary equipment and tools, he would hold on to this, I guess. But um, but no. Yeah, yeah, and you know he had. I think that's how it got released in the first place. Is that he had been holding on to this demon since his dad died, and then I guess he accidentally drops it in the woods and it gets released. Um, but it's like okay, so you've been holding on to it all these years why are you i don't know yeah why are you throwing it into the ocean now so yeah well as we um 
as we look at the, as we, okay, we're, we're at the moment of truth here, Kat, okay? Um, okay. So I'm curious, I, I like to do two recommends, okay? And I know that you stated earlier that Delph has uh, kind of, uh, been on the back burner um, for you compared to Stallone and Schwarzenegger. And I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think a lot of people um, kind of have uh, uh, similar experiences and similar opinions, but I'm curious. I like to do two recommendations. Okay. One as a film in general and one as a, as a Dolph Lundgren film. And I know you said earlier that you actually watched this, this film twice in preparation for this. So your dedication, I think, is amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. But um, what do you think? Is, is this a film that you'd recommend on either of those fronts? You know, I would, as a Dolph Lundgren film, I'm going to say yes, I would recommend it. Because he gets at least a lot of dialogue. He gets to do a lot. He's funny. He's the main character. He's in, like you said, almost every scene. So, yes, if you're a fan of Dolph, then yes, I would recommend it. Um, just as a movie in general, I wouldn't be as emphatic about it, <laughs> about recommending it. It's not, you know, it's not a good movie by any means, but it has some fun. You know, it, it's got some good scenes. It's got, so maybe in a group of friends, if you're having drinks or whatever, you're all going to sit down and be able to watch and laugh, then sure. Yeah, I would recommend it. Well, thank you. Yeah, you know, I would say, um, in my opinion, of all the of all the films that Dolph has done over the last ten years, and believe me, there have been a lot. I don't know if you. Well, actually, I'm, I'm, you did. And when when I uh, directed you to the films that we had left, I mean, yeah, there. I mean, you probably had to sift through quite a few synopses to figure out which one sounded like the most fun. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, th- there have been a ton. I will say this one is easily. Um, one of his best and the most fun. I mean, some could look at that and they think, well, the bar really isn't, uh, isn't that high considering the past decade. But um, I would say <laughs> with this particular film, um, it is fun. Okay. That's the best thing I can say about it. Um, yes, it is low budget. Um, and for lack of better words, it is extremely cheesy at times, but I think it is evident um, just how much fun everyone is having on set with this film. Um, Dolph's character is wild and unique who I could see kickstarting a franchise if the opportunity presented itself. But I think in the end, what I appreciated most about this film was the heart that was on display. Okay. Um, Not only is everyone invested in this film, but I think everyone is really, really giving it their all. I mean, everybody who was on screen, um, everybody who was working behind the scenes, I mean, it's, it's very evident that, um, that everybody truly cared about this film. And, um, I think that effort and that care that was put forth is, is really apparent and, uh, and on display here. And so for that end, I would say as a Dolph Lundgren film, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I wouldn't put this in his top 20, but considering the state of, independent cinema that we have these days, um, especially something that was shot in less than 20 days. I think this is, um, this, this, this stands out quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is, uh, this has been a ton of fun. Um, I, before I let you go, I mean, we talked about it briefly. Um, okay. Yeah. So your book action movie freak is available and your website, you're still updating your website quite frequently. Is that right? Yes. So, yeah, I had taken a hiatus for a few years because life stuff, you know. Um, But, yeah, I'm back up and running about once a week right now. I'm posting something new. And is it just action flicks that you that you review and post on there or because last time I was on there, it looked like you uh, did a little bit of horror. Was it Slumber Party Massacre? Yes. Yeah, I went down a rabbit hole with that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm, yeah, I do both. I do a little bit. It's not just action, um, but yeah, horror and well, right now that's pretty much action and horror, but if something else strikes me, you know, I might put a little comedy action in there too, but it's going to have some elements of action and horror. Okay. You're not going to find any love or romance are on there. Definitely not. Okay. So we're not going to see a post here in the next month on when Harry met Sally or anything like that. You do have, (laughs) you do have your standards. Is that right? Yes. Yes, definitely not. You will be seeing um, 
the Black Christmases coming up in because de- it's December. And actually, I may write something up about this because uh, Don't Kill It is set in around Christmas. Yeah, time. I was going to so, say. I mean, c- can we perfect. can we consider this film a Christmas film? Right. I, I think we can. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so because and he also is like Merry Christmas to everybody after he's you know shooting them in the stomach with rubber bullets. <laughs> yeah. Now, what about um, going back to your book real quick? Um, have you considered doing another follow up, or have you considered um, putting? I, I know that I know that publishing is such a long and laborious process. So sometimes um, a blog or a website, or in my case, a, a podcast is is kind of the easier to do, but have you considered, uh, uh, doing, uh, doing another published book? I, yeah, I have now it's only in like, you know, the considering phase cause I would have to work out all the logistics. Um, but yeah, it was like, cause it definitely needs this. My book came out what, in 2012, I think. So it's been years. It's been, well, I guess 10 years now. And there've been a lot of good movies, action movies since then that would make it into, the best of the best. So I would just got to figure out how I'd want to go about that. Right on. Well, I'll of course be on the lookout for that and uh, I'll include a link to uh, both your book and the website. I love your logo, by the way. Can I just say that real quick as well? The logo for oh, your website. You. Very cool. So well, yeah, thank you. I've got some, some good, let's see, Nick Langley and Marco head. Good artists that helped me out on that one. Oh, cool. Well, I'd love to have you back on if there's anything coming out. I mean, I know Expendables 4 is uh, currently in post, waiting to be released here um, in the next year. So uh, yeah. I imagine you're probably excited for that one as well. So maybe uh, yes. maybe we'll, we'll join forces again if you're interested. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right. To everyone out there who is listening, please feel free to rate and review the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever else you go to subscribe. We always appreciate the reviews, and we'll see you all next time on I Must Break This Podcast. Hello, listeners. Sean here. Uh, Before we close this episode up, I wanted to pass it over to friend of the show, Tom Jolliffe, to give his thoughts on the movie. As we stated earlier, the film is actually pretty similar to an earlier Dolph Lundgren film, The Minion. In fact... Tom actually guested on the episode in which we discussed The Minion over four years ago. Seeing as how the two films share similar themes, I figured it was only right to have Tom come back on the show and give his thoughts on how Don't Kill It stacks up against the previous film in which Dolph battled a body-jumping demon. It should also be noted that Tom is a screenwriter as well, So he has quite a bit of insight on the inner workings of low-budget independent cinema, which Don't Kill It is certainly no stranger to. Tom will be coming back to the show once again soon, but in the meantime, we wanted to give his opinions on today's film. So, with that out of the way, here are Tom Jolliffe's thoughts on Don't Kill It. Hi, this is Tom Jolliffe, screenwriter from the UK, and I'm here to talk about a Dolph Lundgren film, so... There's a body hopping demon. It's moving from person to person and it's abiding its time until the right moment when it can unleash the end of days. Uh, I'm, at, I'm not talking about the minion, by the way. This is don't kill it. So, yeah, Dolph fans, when this one was announced, they kind of pricked their ears up a little bit and they had this kind of moment of recognition that, yeah, uh, this sounds a little bit familiar. So this does sound like the minion. Uh, whereas the Minion was still very much in the Lundgren stable of being an action film uh, with a little bit of fantasy in the whole sort of, uh, you know, the end of days apocalypse scenario. It was very much of the time just before the millennium when those films were in vogue. And Dolph's was kind of the sort of low, lower budget equivalent, I guess, to Ar- Arnold's end of days. Uh, so don't kill it is more in line with something you could imagine Bruce Campbell doing. So this was quite a surprise for Lundgren fans, myself included, but a pleasant surprise being a fan of kind of 80s horror. There are certainly references throughout with the the visuals and the kind of style of gore to, you know, classic indie American horror and Italian horror. Um, And 
when this one came out in film festivals, it came out to sort of very good reviews, got really good responses, at, you know, all the horror fests that it played in. And there was a sense that this could be something new for Dolph, a new direction. And also it felt like a film with potential to become a mini franchise. I mean, his character in this, you know, with the, with a, wearing a cowboy hat and he's got a long leather coat playing this sort of badass demon hunter and he's got his own signature weapon as well. It did really feel like this could have been something that would at least warrant one sequel. I think the key thing, the key thing that makes this film work really is the fact that it, you know, like evil dead or brain dead, um, it kind of, it plays it tongue in cheek and it never takes itself too seriously. And I think what it does is a, a very lean kind of, I think it's sort of 85 minutes, something like that. So it's very lean to the point. Dolph is having a really good time in this film. At the time he was doing, he was sort of mixing up a little bit. You, you know, he'd throw in a curveball every now and again, alongside just generic kind of action films. And this was one of his best ones, I think, in terms of the curveballs. What it did as well, when it finally came out officially, it just didn't seem to get the the release it deserved and it didn't really get the attention it deserved. And I'm not too sure whether that's because the sort of action fans who would generally turn up to see a Lundgren film, whether they were a little bit unwilling to, you know, follow him into this genre. I think sometimes can be an acquired taste, particularly in, you know, certain types of horror. So the, the kind of horror fans and action fans don't necessarily always cross over. And, you know, they found that, in a similar way with something like Universal Soldier, Day of Reckoning, which was very, very horror-infused compared to what the franchise started as. So with Don't Kill It, Mike Mendez writes and directs. Uh, no, he, no, he didn't write, but he has sort of had a concept. He had writers come in and then he, he edited it as well. So he kind of knows how this is going to be pieced together. And it's the kind of material he's kind of done a lot before. So uh, low budget, tongue in cheek horrors. So he knows this grounding really well. He knows how to work within the budgets. For the most part, they kind of get around that. So it's very much a small town setting, very kind of simple locations, the kind that are cheap and easy to get. Sensibly, you know, they make that part of the, the film. So they want everything kind of closed off from the big city. You've got a kind of small town uh, humour, you know, the kind of Dolph's the kind of fish out of water and everyone else is a little bit slow to kind of respond. You've got uh, Christina Klebb as his co-lead here, who's the sort of, he, she's just come back into town. So she's kind of like, you know, three or four steps ahead of the, I guess you call them the, the the hick locals there's a very kind of devout catholic priest that's uh, uh played by james chalk and he provides a lot of humor as well i think what the film does really well is it kind of builds up nicely there's a few kills earlier on very kind of gory so you know what's going to come later on but it builds up to this sequence where all hell breaks loose basically at the, the town hall where suddenly it becomes apparent to everyone what, what is going on and that they're in this kind of end of day scenario. So the demon is body hopping. So once he's killed, he kind of transfers to uh, whoever has killed him, uh, hence the title. Everything goes into chaos at this sequence and you know the film it maintains its momentum from then on. I think it builds up nicely to that point and then it just explodes into life. And then you've got chainsaws, you've got uh, everything you'd expect from something that you would more imagine Bruce Campbell being in. So yeah, it's a very enjoyable film. I think in terms of flaws, I wasn't keen on the sound mix. I think it's one of those where it's punching too hard during the sort of horror sequences. The, the score's a little bit kind of grating at times, particularly in the, the horror sequences. Um, so it's one of those where you're flicking up during dialogue scenes to get, you know, to hear what's going on. And then you're pulling it down, uh, during the horror sequences. Yeah. So sound mix was just one of my few points of contention really, but otherwise, you know, this is one of those I really enjoy, but it's a little bit bittersweet because I think that 
certainly the Lundgren fans and action fans didn't really take to it quite as it deserved. Horror fans didn't really get a hold of it either, unfortunately. What could have had a a bit of a franchise or at least one sequel kind of faded out a little bit. So that's the nature of the the low budget indie world. You just don't know. There's no rhyme or reason to what will take off and what doesn't, but there we go. So yeah, don't kill it. Certainly one that I would recommend and I hope everyone enjoys it. (laughs) 